Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining for this morning's GCSE Physics live group tutorial. The topic today is motion and moments. Hope everyone had a nice evening. Um, and thanks for joining us for the first of um, a number of live group tutorials we have today. So kicking off with physics this morning, um, then we've got English at 11, maths at 2 and biology at 3.15. Um, so as usual, this um, session will go on for around one hour. So we'll finish at course to 11 and um, this will be recorded. So you'll be able to watch back this live group tutorial on the MyTutor YouTube channel. Um, and we also have lots of shorter topic videos that are related to all of these webinars that have been going on the past few weeks. So if you want some extra um, resources, then check out our YouTube channel um, and those will be there. So as usual, ask any questions you have um, for myself. I'm Tilly, I work at my tutor. Let me know if you have any questions about the online school or these tutorials or to our tutor, Prashela. You can pop those messages in the chat and Q&A. Um, so lots of you know Prashela already. Um, she's our wonderful physics tutor who's been doing these sessions um, for the past few weeks. So she studies um, physics at Loughborough University and this is her fourth year as a tutor. Um, is the math tutorial today foundation? Someone's asked. Um, no, today's uh, session is a higher session, um, as is Wednesday's session, and then Thursday um, is another foundation session, um, and then Friday um, is higher session. So all sessions this week are higher apart from Thursday, um, and yesterday's session as well, if you wanted to catch up on that, um, that's already on our YouTube channel. Um, cool, so Prashela, are you all ready? Yeah, already. Brilliant, let's get started. Okay, so what we're going to be covering today is um, a little bit carrying on from the last webinar that we had, which if you were there, we went over kind of forces in motion too. We went over Newton's laws of motion. Um, and if you remember the second law of motion, it's F equals MA. Um, so the AQA exam board um, requires you to do a practical on Newton's second law. So that's what we're going to go through first. And then we're going to understand what moments are um, and perform basic calculations with them. Then we're going to go on to understand how levers and gears work. Then we'll go through some example questions as well as time for questions at the end. Okay, so um, first of all, we're going to go through this required practical. So required practicals are really important, not only because you obviously do them in school and it helps you to understand um, more about the physical aspect of the equations that you're learning, but also because they can test any element of the required practical in the exam. So it's important that you know the required practicals inside out. So as I said, this one's going to be on acceleration and it kind of splits down into two parts. So first of all, we're going to be looking at the effect of varying the force on the acceleration of an object of constant mass. So we're going to be varying the force, but keeping the mass the same. And for the second part of the experiment, we're going to be varying the mass, but keeping the force the same. OK, so two similar but slightly different experiments, which use the same apparatus, but test different things. So we're going to be changing some things, keeping some things constant, and always measuring acceleration. So we're trying to investigate how acceleration changes if we change force or if we change mass. And it's all done with our Newton's second law equation, F equals MA. So this is for the first part of the experiment. So this is varying the force so we're varying the force keeping the mass constant so the, con the mass would be your control variable and we're always measuring acceleration so this setup um, is quite complicated it's probably one of the mo more complicated apparatus um, for practicals so what you can see here is a vacuum cleaner blowing out air um, going through a tube and then we have this kind of grey prism shaped thing now that's called an air track and those little holes are where the air comes out and it basically is used to reduce the friction 
between the glider, which is the yellow thing, and the air track. So if we reduce friction, that means we can get a more accurate reading of just how fast the glider is going. Okay, so we use this glider to help us measure acceleration. The glider is just a piece of um, material which sits on top of the air track and it glides along it. Okay, now you also have two light gates. You have one here and one here, a set distance apart. Now those light gates go to a computer. Okay, they go to um, a computer in the lab and go onto some sort of software that will read the readings from these light gates. So the light gate will be able to tell the speed at which the glider goes through it and the same with the second light gate. So you're going to get two readings of speed and therefore we can work out acceleration. Okay, so the, we don't actually have to do it. The software does it all for us, which is great. It takes the two readings of speed, takes the distance that the light gates are apart, and it works out the acceleration for us. So that's how the light gates work. So there's no kind of manual starting and stopping of stopwatches from us. So we can reduce the human error in this way. So we're relying all on software to do it for us, which is much, much more accurate than a human doing it, which obviously you then have reaction times of starting and stopping the stopwatch. So it can become very inaccurate. So that's the reason light gates are used. Now, for the force aspect, to be able to vary the force, we need to have a force acting on our glider. Okay, so we have our equation F equals MA, but where does F come from where does m come from we know we're measuring acceleration using light gates but how are we going to vary force and keep mass the same well keeping mass the same is easy we just have the glider and the card of a set mass okay so that's the mass that's the mass aspect of the experiment is the weight of the glider and the card but the force is done in a different way so the force uses this red string attached here to the glider. So it uses this red string attached to the glider, which passes over a bench pulley. So you need to know what a bench pulley is. It's basically this disc here, which allows the, the string to kind of pass over it nicely and hang nicely without touching the table. So that's, that's the bench pulley. And it's important that you include that in your method as well. With a weight, hanger uh, on the bottom of it. They should be familiar to you. Um, they're also used in the Hooke's Law experiment. Um, it's basically a slotted mass carrier where you can add more and more weights on. Okay, so that is where our force is gonna come from. Now we also need to remember, force is different to mass. So whilst we are adding masses on, okay, so we're adding, 20 gram masses on each time to vary the force but we need to do something to the mass first so to convert the masses that we're adding on into force we need to times by um gravity 9.8 Okay, so we have a mass of 0 0.02, for example, we need to times by gravity, 9.8, to get us the weight in newtons. Okay, so yes, we're adding masses on, but it's to create a force. So we need to know what the force is in newtons, and to go from mass to force or weight, we need to times by 9.8. Okay, so the force is being created by the weight, okay? And yes, you do need to convert to kilograms as well. So if, if you have a 20 gram mass that you're adding on, you first need to convert it into kilograms, so 0 0.02, and then you need to um, 
convert it into newtons. Okay, convert it into a force by timesing by 9.8. Okay, so that's, there's quite a lot of maths to be done in this experiment. Going through the method then, we set up our air track, we put the bench pulley at the end, we put the two light gates on the air track, take the glider from the air track set, so that'll be provided with to you, and we cut an interrupt card. Now what an interrupt card is, is this kind of card that comes with the light gates, um, and it's basically what the light gate uses to detect speed. So as soon as it senses the interrupt card, so as soon as the card interrupts the light gate, it can be measured. So that's all it's used for. It's used as a tool to measure speed. So why do we need two speeds? Well, if we go back to, again, the previous webinar, you may remember this equation here. To be able to work out acceleration, we always need two speeds because remember, acceleration is the change in speed over time. So acceleration is the change, remember that triangle is just change, in speed over time. Okay, so that's why we need two speeds. Either this equation or this equation requires you to have two speeds. So for the light gates, they're going to be using this equation here to work out acceleration. They have a final speed, they have initial speed, they have that the um, light gates are a certain distance apart and therefore the software will work out acceleration. Okay, it may use this equation, it really depends what light gates you have, but it's going to use one of those equations to work out the acceleration. Okay, now you, after you do that, you're going to connect the glider to the hanging mass with a string. So you're going to put the string on to the glider in some way. Uh, so you're going to connect the glider to the string and the string is connected to the hanging mass which is there. So you're going to have a three kind of part system going on there. Then when it's all nice and neatly lined up we can start adding our masses on. So we need to first of all know the weight of the mass carrier itself, that's going to be your starting point. Then we're going to add 20 gram masses, take a reading of acceleration, Add 20 gram masses, take a reading of acceleration. Now, how do we take our readings of acceleration? Well, we're going to hold the glider at this end of the air track. We're going to hold it and then we're going to release it. The light gates are going to sense it. Okay, so we're going to hold it in place. As soon as we release it, we take our measurement of acceleration as it goes between the two light gates. And then we're going to do that for every addition of the 20 gram masses. Okay, so then we're going to have a few different forces because you keep adding on masses to the string. So we're going to have a few different forces in our table and a few different readings of acceleration in our table. So we're going to plot our graph, which we always need to do at the end of an experiment to actually find out um, what, you know, what's going on, what we're trying to measure. So we're going to plot force against acceleration. So force against acceleration. And then we're going to get, hopefully, if we've done it right, a straight line graph. Okay, now a straight line graph represents that, there, that the two things, the two things on the axis are proportional to each other. So if F doubles, A doubles, F triples, A triples, they're proportional to each other. That is shown because there's a straight line graph. Okay, they change in the same way. Now the gradient of the line represents mass. Okay, the gradient of the line represents mass. So in an exam, you may be asked, what does the gradient of the line represent? That's mass. Work out the mass from the graph, but well, then you need to work out the gradient of the line and then give the mass 
Um, and that's how that first part of the experiment is done. Okay, and the reason that mass is the gradient of that graph is because if you take this equation and make it y equals mx, so you may know that the equation of a line is y equals mx plus c. Um, so we're going to kind of fit it to y equals mx to be able to plot it. I've already done that with f and a. You can see that I've plotted f on the y-axis because they match, a on the x-axis because they match, which therefore tells me that m mass must be the gradient. Okay, so y equals mx, f equals ma, we fit them together, we plot f on the y, a on the x, so that we get a gradient of mass. Okay. Remember that it can also be done the other way around. Any graph can be plotted either way, but the gradient will change. So this time we have A over F, so our gradient is going to be 1 over M. So just be careful what the graph is telling you. So you, you won't probably be asked to plot the graph in the exam because it, is, it takes up quite a lot of time. But they may give you a graph already. So they'll give you a graph there and it will have force and acceleration or acceleration and force. So make sure you know which um, value is on which axis. So is acceleration on the x, force on the y, or acceleration on the y, force on the x. Then you know what the gradient is going to be. So it's important to pay attention to what's on the axis. It's not always going to be this one. It's not always going to be this one. So you have to pay attention to that. Okay, so that's varying the force, but keeping mass the same. So we're keeping the mass of the glider and the card the same the entire time, that's not changing, but we're varying the force by varying what goes on down here to provide the force. So by adding more and more masses to the string, we're providing a force on the glider. But the actual mass of the glider stays the same. So the second part, is burying the mass this time, but keeping the force constant. So we use the exact same apparatus. However, this time, the force, which is created in this kind of area of the experiment here, stays the same. Okay, so we're gonna add a certain mass, we're gonna add a 100 gram mass, and then we're gonna leave it. And then it's gonna stay the same the entire experiment. We're keeping force the same. So we're going to add one 100 gram mass on and then leave it and never change it. That's keeping it constant. However, we're varying the mass. Now remember, the mass relates to the glider on the card. That's the object that we're experimenting on. Okay. So first of all, we need to measure the glider and the mass. We need to actually know how much the glider and the mass, uh, the glider and the card weigh. I'm just going to put our glider and the card on the scales, weigh them, do the experiment. That's our first one. Then we're going to add masses to the glider to change the mass of the glider. Okay, so we're going to keep adding on masses to the glider. So we're going to add masses here to vary the mass. So first bit's exactly the same, but we're going to connect the glider to the hanging mass with a string, exactly the same. Add our 100 gram mass to the string, so this time it's not 20 grams, we're just going to go um, straight in with a 100 gram mass and keep that there. Don't touch it, leave it, that stays the same. What we're varying this time is to do with the glider. So we're going to add masses on to the glider. Do the experiment, add another mass to the glider, do the experiment, add another mass to the glider, do the experiment. And measuring acceleration in the same way, holding the glider at this end of the air track, releasing it and letting the light gates do the work and work out the acceleration for us. Okay. So... 
that explains um, the first part of the experiment and the second part of the experiment. Um, so this one, the graph that you want to be plotting is one over mass against acceleration. And you'll see why in a second. Um, remember, they can be either way, but it is going to change what your gradient is. So we're going to be plotting one over mass this time instead of what we had before, which was um, just mass for our gradient and F and A. So you've kind of got another step to get to the graph, which is doing one divided by your total mass. Then you're going to plot a graph and you're going to get a straight line because they are proportional to each other. So this is all investigating these two rules, which come from Newton's second law. So what you're doing with these two experiments is investigating that acceleration is directly proportional to force, which we can see here. Acceleration is proportional to force by this straight line graph. And we are seeing that acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. Acceleration is inversely proportional to mass because when you plot acceleration against one over mass, you get a straight line graph. So remember, inversely proportional, proportional means that if acceleration doubles, mass halves. Okay, so they kind of do the opposite to each other. So if acceleration doubles, mass halves, acceleration triples, mass reduces by a factor of three. However, for acceleration and force, if one doubles, the other doubles. Okay, so you need to know those relations from Newton's second law, from this equation here. And that we can get them from the two experiments that we've just done. Okay, so moving on to moments. Here you've got kind of four pictures of moments that we see in everyday life. So um, moments are a force or a system of forces that can cause an object to rotate. So really it's a rotating force. Now the turning effect of this force is what we call a moment. So if a force causes a rotation, that's called a moment. So for example, when you're turning a spanner, that's going to create a moment because you're doing, you're making a force create a rotation. Okay, so you're putting a force on the spanner and that's causing a rotation. Again, with a door, you're putting a force on the door and it's causing a rotation around the hinges. With a seesaw, you're pushing it forwards and it's rotating round. Um, sorry, with a merry-go-round. And then with a seesaw, you're pushing down on either side and that's rotating the plank around this pivot. What you're commonly gonna see is um, spanners and seesaws um, most, but remember they can use um, any kind of example and one that we have never seen before, but the most common ones are seesaws and spanners. Okay, so what is a moment and how do we calculate a moment? So a moment of a force is force times distance. Okay, so moment equals force times distance. The moment of the force is measured in Newton meters, so Nm, because we're doing Newtons times meters, right? It makes sense. Newtons times meters, moment is measured in Newton meters. Nothing special there. Then we move on to distance. Now, in an exam, they may write it as this form of the equation, moment equals force times distance, or they might write it, might write it as the more specific version which is moment of a force equals force times perpendicular distance from the pivot to the line of action of the force. So actually, yes, they say distance, but there's a more specific version of distance, which is the perpendicular distance from the pivot to the force. Don't worry too much about the line of action of the force. It basically just means 
to the force. So the pivot to the force, that's the distance that we're measuring. The reason that it says the perpendicular distance is because it wants a distance that is at a right angle to the force. Okay, so for this one here, we've got a force acting downwards. They want the perpendicular distance to that, the distance that is at a right angle to that. So if we now draw a right angle in, we can see that this distance is the one that we want, the perpendicular distance to the pivot. Okay, so the perpendicular distance to the pivot is just this distance here. The force is perpendicular to that. Okay, so you can see here the force is going that way. The man is pushing it forward that way. So our distance that is perpendicular to that is going to be this distance here. Again, with um, a door, if you're going to push it this way, the distance needs to be perpendicular to that. So if we draw a right angle in, you can see that we need to do this distance here. Again, here the force is acting downwards. So the distance that is perpendicular to that is this distance here, not this distance here. Okay, so we've got to be really careful with how specific we are when it comes to distance. So it wants this distance here, not the distance of the spanner, which is what you might think initially for this specific example. So it's important that we know exactly where we're measuring distance to. Okay, so here I've got a statement that says it's easier to use a longer spanner when trying to turn a nut and easiest to push further from the hinge when opening a door. So what we've done there is increase the distance. We're using a longer spanner. We're using a longer distance to apply the force to open the door. So if we make distance larger, moment increases. Okay, so if we make distance bigger, moment gets bigger. Same for force, if we make force bigger, moment gets bigger. So here, we're saying it's easier to use a longer spanner, easier to push further away from the pivot, from the hinges of the door. So that's increasing the distance, which increases the moment. So what this statement tells you is that if you increase the moment of a force, it's much easier to create the kind of action that you want. So if we increase the moment of a force, it's much easier for a human. Bigger moment is great, it's easier. Smaller moment is much harder to get what we want. Then we have our law of moments. So here, you can see a beam with a pivot. So pivot is where it kind of uh, balances around. So that pivot point is where it's balanced on, the beam is balanced on. You can see you've got a box on the left and a box on the right of the same shape, same size, same material. So they're gonna balance each other out, um, much like a seesaw. Now, if an object is balanced, the total clockwise moment about a pivot equals the total anti-clockwise moment about a pivot. So what that means is that if the object is balanced, the moment on this side is equals the moment on this side. So force times distance here on the right hand side equals force times distance on the left hand side. You won't need to do calculations with um, anti-clockwise and clockwise, but you do need to know the law in words. Okay, so um, the clockwise moment is called a clockwise moment because if you imagine taking this force and kind of pulling on it, like with a string, that's going to cause the beam to rotate clockwise. Same thing if you imagine the string um, on this force here and you pull it, that's going to create an anti-clockwise motion, so an anti-clockwise moment. Okay, so you need to know that the clockwise moments equal the anti-clockwise moments if an object is balanced.
Okay, so here's a, a practice exam question for us. So here we've got a spanner and we're told that a force of 40 newtons is applied to the spanner to turn the nut. So a force going this way of 40 newtons is applied by the person with a perpendicular distance of 30 centimetres. So the perpendicular distance, remember, is at a right angle to the force and is 30 centimetres. So we want to find the moment of the force. So remember, moment equals force times perpendicular distance. So put your answers in the chat. What would the moment of this force be? Using our equation. Okay, I'm getting a few different answers, um, mostly variations around 12. So some are saying 1,200 newton meters, some are saying um, 12. So be really careful, remember to convert our distance into meters first. So we never work with centimeters when we're doing calculations, um, unless you're specifically told to, um, for example, in a speed, question so unless it says specifically give your answers in centimeters per second we need to convert to meters so converting 30 centimeters to meters is 0 0.3 then timesing by 40 is 12 newton meters so just be careful those of you that did it straight away you um, need to convert centimeters to meters first so um, it's 0 0.3 times 40, so the answer is 12 newton meters. So remember, moment is measured in newton meters. Okay, great. Um, this one now is slightly more complicated and slightly more advanced and only applies to certain exam boards. Um, so we have a seesaw and we've got a parent and a child on it. So I'm just going to put them um, as boxes for now because we don't need to draw people. Okay, so this is our child. I'll label it with a C. And we're told that the child weighs 250 newtons. Okay, so 250 newtons. And is sitting 2.4 meters from the pivot. So the distance between the child and the pivot, which is this triangle here, is 2.4. Now we're also told that there's an adult sitting down. This is adult. And they weigh 750 newtons. Now we're told that the seesaw must be balanced. The seesaw must be balanced. That means that the moment on the left hand side of the pivot equals the moment on the right hand side of the pivot. So the moment over here equals the moment over here. So first of all, we're going to work out the moment on the left. So the moment on the left is 2.4 times 250, because that's distance times force, which is 600 Newton meters. So we've worked out our moment on the left. Now we need to know what distance the parent must be sat at for the seesaw to be balanced. So we know that the moment of the parent must also be 600 newton meters. So this time we've been given moment, we've been given force, we need to times it by distance to get 600. So what do we times 750 by? To get 600, we times by 0 0.8. So really well done if you said that the, the adult must be sitting at a distance of 0 0.8 meters for the seesaw to be imbalanced. So 0 0.8 
So that's how to do um, a more complicated moments question. And luckily that's as complicated as it's gonna get really with the maths. This is only for certain examples. Okay, so moving on now to the third part of the webinar, which is learning about levers and gear. So really applying um, this idea of moments. So four levers, they consist of a pivot, an effort and a lobe. So three components that make up a lever. The way that the components are arranged gives us different applications. So if we have an arrangement of effort, pivot, load, that is used in seesaws, crowbars and scissors. If we have pivot, load, effort, that's wheelbarrows and nutcrackers. If we have pivot, effort, load, we have tweezers and cooking tongs. Okay, so the, really the way that um, the components of a lever are arranged gives us different applications for the levers. Gears then are slightly more complicated. So where a gears, where two gears meet, the teeth must both move in the same direction. So the teeth of this gear move upwards and the teeth of this gear move upwards. But they rotate in opposite directions. So this one's rotating that way, anti-clockwise. This gear's rotating to the right, so clockwise. So although their teeth are both going upwards, the gear on the left is rotating anti-clockwise and the gear on the right is rotating clockwise. So that's the first rule of gears that we need to know. The second rule is that the forces acting on the teeth are identical for both gears, but their moments are different. So the force acting on the gears is this one and this one, but their moments are different. Okay, so if a larger gear is driven by a smaller gear, the large gear will rotate slowly, but have a greater moment. If a smaller gear is driven by a larger gear, the larger gear will rotate quickly, but have a smaller moment. So really, it's just um, a case of learning these two rules. Um, large gear is driven by a smaller gear. The large gear will rotate slowly, but have a greater moment. Smaller gear is driven by a larger gear. The larger gear will rotate quickly, but will have a smaller moment. So it really just means kind of learn um, those two rules and how gears kind of work using those and i think that's all the content yeah okay so we've got plenty of time for um questions so i'm going to start off with our quick fire questions what is the moment what is the unit of a moment so put your answers in the chat So what is a moment and what is the unit? Great, so a moment is the turning effect of a force. And the unit is Newton meters, brilliant. So not Newtons per meter, not just Newtons, Newton meters. It's important, and this might sound a bit stupid, but it's important that you get the correct capital letters. So N must be a capital letter. M must be a small uh, lowercase letter. Because if you start changing the case of the letters, so if you do uppercase, lowercase, um, interchangeably, that means a completely different thing. So be really careful with that. I've seen it come up as an exam question, and it might sound really trivial, but actually they had four kind of multiple choice answers. One was capital N, lowercase m, so the correct one. And then they had lots of different variations. They had like a 
lowercase n capital M, and that was in an exam question. Um, and that applies to all units, really. Make sure you know which one's a capital letter and which one's a lowercase letter, um, because if you don't get that correct, it can mean a completely different thing. Okay, and it shows really good understanding to the examiner um, if you put your units just everywhere. Just always keep your units there. Okay, um, so what is the name given to the shortest distance between the line of action of a force and the pivot? Good, so that's the perpendicular distance. And what is the moment of a six Newton force acting 1.5 meters from a pivot? So remember, moment equals force times distance. You have a six Newton force and a 1.5 meter distance. So when you times them together, what do we get? We get nine. Careful, they've tried to trick you here by doing two different units. Um, not newtons per meter, newton meters. What is the principle of moments? Is it total clockwise moment is bigger than total anticlockwise moment? They're equal or clockwise is smaller than anticlockwise? What is our law? What is our principle of moments? Good, they are equal. What is the name of the force applied to a lever? What is the name of the force applied to a lever? I didn't say this one um, exactly. So the, the force is called the effort. Okay, so the effort that we need to apply the lever to move. Okay, so the name of the force is the effort. Bro, well, loads of you got that. Okay, so we get to do some exam questions now. Um, So for this one, we've got a spanner being used to tighten a nut and we need to calculate the moment being applied to the nut in the figure. So we've been given a force, but we've been given three different distances. So you need to pick which one is the correct distance and then work out the moment. So take a minute to think about what the answer to this might be, which distance you're going to use. You know which force you're going to be using, but which distance are you going to use? So you might want to continue the force out and see which one is at right angles. So it's not this one, is it? Because that's not a right angle to the force. That's some weird angle that we don't know. It's definitely not this one because they're parallel. That's parallel to the force. So it must be our 20 centimeter distance because you can see they're at right angles to each other. The force and the distance are at right angles to each other. Okay. So we're going to pick our 20 centimetre distance because that is the perpendicular distance. That's the correct one. Okay. 
remembering to change our 20 centimeters into meters which is why i think we're getting different answers in the chat um so change 20 centimeters into meters and then times it so you should be getting 40 newton meters so it says give your answer in newton meters so we need to give it as 40 newton meters now the moment can be increased by making a greater force on the spanner. So we can make a bigger moment and therefore make it easier for us. So remember, a bigger moment means easier for a human. And we can create a bigger moment by increasing the force. But what else can we do to make the moment bigger? So yes, we can increase force to increase the moment, but what else can we do? Remember, increasing the moment makes it easier for us. So we want to try and do this where possible. Cool, so loads of you are saying use a longer spanner, increase the distance. That's perfect. So um, there's two different ways to increase the moment, either by increasing the force or by increasing the distance. Okay, so increasing the distance. So remember, not this distance, that doesn't matter. That's really important. So it's not necessarily the distance of the spanner. That's not always going to be the case. Okay, so it's wrong to say use a longer spanner. What we instead want to say is increase the perpendicular distance to the pivot because as you can see the perpendicular distance is not the length of the spanner they're two different distances so we have to be really specific when we're answering this question we need to increase the perpendicular distance so we need to increase this distance here now yes that would mean increasing the spanner's length but what we want to say to be more specific is increase the perpendicular distance okay so that would be how you would get marks for that question be really careful that's why i say be really careful what distance you're working with okay so here we have two children a and b sitting on a seesaw and the seesaw is balanced Okay, um, as I said, you won't have to do the calculations where you have to work out kind of child's A distance and weight. Um, this is the one we did, I think it was page 10. So you won't necessarily have to do this. This is a harder, higher tier, certain example question. Um, so for this one we have child a child b sitting on the seesaw we want to work out the moment of child b we've been given a force we've been given a distance first of all we need to verify is that the correct distance is it the perpendicular distance to the force to the pivot and we can see that it is because it's at perpendicular it's at right angles to the force you may see it be called the line of action of the force. That just kind of means um, in the same direction as the force. So if you were to extend the force, they would be perpendicular to each other. So we've been given a distance. We've been given a force. We should be able to work out the moment. Remembering to convert something. So put your answers in the chat. What moment do you get when you have a 280 Newton and force and a 90 centimeter distance?
Cool, Lozi, you're saying 252 newton meters, that's correct. So quite um, a basic one, quite a standard one that you'll get in an exam um, is to calculate the moment of a force. Now, what would happen if child B moved closer to the pivot? So what would happen if child B moved this up? Child B moved closer to the pivot. So this distance is going to decrease. If child B moves closer to the pivot, the perpendicular distance to the pivot is going to decrease. So it's no longer going to be 90 centimetres, it's going to be something smaller, let's say 30. So let's say child B now moves to here. What happens? So using the idea of moments, so you need to relate it back to moments, what would happen? Loads of you saying seesaw would not be balanced, brilliant, but why, what happens to the moment if we decrease the distance? What happens to the moment if we decrease the distance? Cool. So the moment decreases, it will be a smaller moment. Child B will have a smaller moment because if, if distance is decreased, moment is decreased. If force is decreased, moment is decreased. It's quite nice like that. If one thing increases, everything increases. So it's quite nice. It's quite a nice equation like that. Um, okay, so the clockwise moment of B decreases okay so you need to be saying clockwise moment of b decreases um therefore the seesaw um is no longer balanced the moments are no longer balanced so the clockwise moment no longer equals the anti-clockwise moment and therefore child a moves downwards so if b moves over here child a moves downwards or child B moves upwards, either role. So we need to be talking about clockwise moments and anti-clockwise moments. We need to be getting those key words in there. So remember, this is a clockwise moment. This is an anti-clockwise moment, okay? Okay, so um, I'm going to take some questions now before we move on to um, this question. So put them in the chat or put them on the Q&A if you do have any questions. Uh, Prashayla, what year is this content usually taught? Is it year 10 or 11? Um, so this content is usually taught in year 11. Great, thank you. Um, let's just have a look. Um, someone asked what exam board are these questions from? Um, so the practice questions that I've been picking up, so the actual exam questions are AQA. Um, and the kind of quick fire questions are applicable to every single exam board. So um, yeah, these ones are AQA. But if you go on physics and maths tutor, there's questions for every exam board. Brilliant. Um, and what is a fulcrum and where would it be on the diagram? Okay, so a fulcrum is basically just another word for a pivot. So the fulcrum would be here. That's the fulcrum. And then in a door, this would be the fulcrum, the hinges. Um, this would be the fulcrum, the pivot. Fulcrum is just another kind of word for pivot. And do you happen to know um, what chapter this comes under the AQA spec? And sort of roughly how many marks would um, there be from questions on this topic in an exam? Um, okay, so the chapter, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but it comes under forces. So if you go to forces and then you go to um, moments, levers and gears is the name of the chapter. So it's called moments, levers and gears and that includes um, everything that we've done today, except the required practical that's going to be in uh, motion, forces in motion. And then in terms of how many marks this would be in an exam, it will probably take up a whole question. So question, so it would take up like question three of an exam. 
and what they're probably going to do is ask you to do a mathematical mathematical calculation um so something like this that's going to usually be uh two marks so one for doing the calculation one for getting the right answer two marks then they might ask you kind of a qualitative question so what would happen theoretically if child b were to move closer to the pivot that's going to be three marks um and i would say roughly five to eight marks is how many marks this moments might take up in an exam obviously you can never say because they might do a really small question on moments and then do a six marker on acceleration for example um so you can never really say but um the kind of layout of the questions is going to be usually a calculation and then if we slightly change it what would happen Right, shall we um, quickly do the final question um, and then we'll see if there are any more questions at the very end. Okay, so um, a spanner makes it a lot easier to loosen a bolt. Now, you usually can't loosen a bolt with your fingers, so you've got a bolt here and they're trying to loosen it with their fingers, then they, do this, they use a spanner and it's much easier. So, why is it much easier using a spanner? So the spanner is a simple what? What fills in that gap? The spanner is a simple lever. Okay, so the spanner acts as a lever. It's a, a application of moments in the form of a lever. And then um, you use it to produce a bigger what on the bolt. So we've increased the distance. We're no longer touching it. We're much further away from the bolt. Now increasing the distance, we know it increases the moment. So we can use it to produce a bigger moment on the bolt. Remember turning effect is just the same as a moment. A longer spanner works better. This is because there is a bigger distance between your force here and what? What are we measuring the distance to? There is a bigger distance between your force and the pivot. Yeah, so much easier to do a, to use a spanner because we're increasing the distance, which increases the moment. And if we have a bigger moment, it's much easier for a human to do. Okay, so that is a, a final question. And um, if anyone's got any more questions, I think we're putting them in the chat. Yeah, there's a couple of questions for me um, about various other subjects that we don't offer yet. Um, just watch this space and watch your emails. Um, I don't have any news yet to share about new subjects, except that it's most likely that the first language we'll be offering um, next week or the week after will be French, but other languages may follow. Um, so thank you for the interest in the other subjects. We will always let you know well in advance what we'll be offering so that you can sort of work that into your daily timetable. Um, not many other questions, so I think we'll wrap up there um, right on time. Thanks very much for attending today, guys. Um, great session. And um, as I said at the beginning, this has been recorded, so you'll be able to access this um, from this evening on the my 2 YouTube channel, along with all the past recordings as well. So um, if you're joining us for any other sessions today, we've got GCSE English in 15 minutes. Um, which should be a great session that's tips and tricks for your paper one question three exam then we've got um, maths at 2 p.m and biology at 3 15 um, if not then see you in the next GCSE physics session um, which is tomorrow at 3 15 um, and thanks very much Priscilla for today's session thank you see you guys soon bye bye